presentation so you can also Recording follow it. Is on. Okay. Uh, take a look at that. That's the presentation I'm working from. So feel free to get right in there. And that is anyone on the internet can view. So you sh anyone should be able to view that. Yep, that looks fine. And before I start, so how much do you guys know about open source ecology? Uh, should I go from the very beginning, or are you guys familiar with the project pretty much, or not really? Start from the beginning, even if some of us know a bit about it. Okay. Yes. Better to start from the beginning. I, I know something, but uh, go for the beginning. Okay. Okay. Let's go from the beginning. I see a bunch of people popped into the presentation, so let me go into um, share. Let me share my screen. So. Bottom left. There we go. Let's do it. So you guys can see. Um... Yes, we see your screen. OK, excellent, excellent. So Global Village Construction Set, that's our work. Um, started the project right after getting out of uh, grad school. I did fusion physics and then learned that I was useless in making pressing, <laughs> addressing pressing world issues. So I started the open source ecology project, thinking about how we can use collaborative open source ways of creating a, a new civilization. Or really, uh, it started as um, my initial incentive was when I was in, in grad school, I couldn't talk openly about my work to others. I was studying fusion energy, and, and therefore I was questioning, well, how, how is it that we're so non-collaborative and we're, you know, we're trying to solve pressing issues that there was a real contradiction to me. So I started the project about exploring what it would look like to create uh, an operating system for Earth that's based on collaboration and open transparency on everything, starting with the economy. So um, I have a TED talk on this, uh, the Global Village Construction Set. You can take a look at that. I won't get into that. But um, the overview of what I'd like to present a little overview of what, what we have done to date. Uh, the proofs of concept in terms of open source economic development. And now we're getting into a project on open source architecture, which we started heavily in 2016. And now we're taking trying to take it to prime time. Um, and I will discuss the concept of the missing link for what I think is the key missing link in, in, in open. And that is open hardware. That is not open software, but open hardware, where it's about taking products to completion. And our response to that is a, a model that we're developing called Extreme Enterprise, which is how do you address the fact that no, no open hardware projects ever get finished? So we're trying to take a very serious stab at that question based on our own work, where, where we see how difficult it is to make hardware. So we started by prototyping different machines like the brick press, the tractor, um, milestones that we, we have achieved so far. So we, we're into building open source heavy machines. Um, for everything from agriculture to construction to energy to production manufacturing and uh, it's been a long path and we've done a lot of prototyping like this this graph just shows up to 2013 like about 67 different machines were built uh, this is all our prototypes we started with the brick press um, that's the first one when we found that people can replicate it open source design. This is the first ever replication where, where, where I saw this first. It was quite a surprise. This is a, a machine for making block out of earth. Uh, this guy downloaded our plans from the internet and he built it completely independently. It's like, okay, wow, a power of open hardware. That's, that's good. We had decent instructionals, IKEA-like fabrication diagrams that enable people to re replicate it. Um, We've developed other things like tractors where we work with radical modularity as far as a way to, to build things in an effective and quick way. Uh, so this is the, the kind of modular approach where we're using reusable parts from the structural to like structural frames to power units that are modular to, to universal rotors that are modular, such as this rotor that's used either to power this trencher at the front or the wheels on the tractor itself. Uh, same same module is used, so power of modularity. And this is uh, same power cube, for example, is used in this micro tractor. So uh, modularity and module-based design is the key, breaking down complex hardware into manageable chunks so that we can make uh, technology accessible to everybody. And building on the world of open software, we, we break down 
machines into modules and go through many development steps for each module to make this happen. Uh, we talk about a construction set approach as well, uh, as in we've demonstrated that, that a construction set approach could work for heavy machines too. Like, like when we build a tractor, we, we can design not only for a tractor, but for all kinds of heavy machines like a backhoe or a bulldozer and so forth. And that applies not only to mechanical, but also to electrical systems like modular power electronics for building things up to induction furnaces and so forth. Um, we've been able by modularity to reduce prototyping cycles from months to days. So here's a, uh, iron worker machine that we built in six months on the left and the one that we said oh, heck okay that's that's really hard to build like if you're going to put six months into that too much so we built the one on the right hand side a machine that cuts one by ten inch slabs of steel um, the one on the right took us 24 hours with two people so once again uh, modularity reduce the the design to absolute simplest possible and by doing that we found that we can do very rapid builds such as one day where we were able to build the brick press here uh, this was a, a one day build where we ended up with 12 people building one of the the big compressed earth block presses which weigh about a ton in a single day it was a very long day like, like till midnight but we found that hey you can actually do this um, we discovered that scalability is a v valid feature uh, here we show scalability. So we, we build things like 3D printers as well. We show scalability where you have, uh, this is a CNC universal axis computer controlled for making a 3D printer, but the same kind of axis can actually be used to make larger machines like this one cubic meter 3D printer or this much larger axis. that's not eight millimeter rods, but one inch 25 millimeter rods that can be used for something like a torch table, which you can use to, to cut steel with, or actually even bigger, like with two inch, uh, shafts that are used for a larger heavy-duty machine like uh, this is in, in progress on a CNC heavy-duty CNC machine so scalability works we also learn how to do real-time documentation as you may know that in uh, in any open work documentation is a big deal you always lose it but we learn how to by uploading and collaborating online on Google Hangouts and Hangouts like today you can get uh, documentation happening at the same time. So when we built this iron worker machine, in one of our builds, we had an instructional at the same time that we built it. So real-time documentation can work. We, we explore the concept of swarm builds. This is the Amish version of it, but our version is this. So this is our seed eco home, which was built with 50 people in five days. So that's, uh, we're really pushing the limits of open design and collaborative builds to, uh, to basically, I mean, the, the vision here is actually pretty, pretty grand in terms of, um, big picture scenario is shifting from finance capital to open source social capital i.e no longer is capital the limiting barrier to people attaining prosperity but open access so we're developing workflows and methods where where you can use people power and open source design and collaborative economics to uh, build even large things. And this could scale to like, for example, v Vivi House, for those who know it from Austria, the project, they're into open source, larger scale housing, like up to six stories, right? Uh, imagine building that with a thousand people over a weekend instead of going to a rock concert. <laughs> so models where you use uh, leverage crowd design and a very modular process to get uh, remarkable results. And this is actually like, you cannot really see this from here, but this is all modular construction, four by eight foot panels that are, were built in a workshop and then assembled, assembled rapidly into place um, as an example of modular breakdown of a project into a build that was very rapid. This is some other work, initial work with bricks, uh, swarm builds on the brick houses. You got to develop the the workflow very carefully. So we kind of planned it all out in advance. And we are, we are actually able to build like in this, this was a build in Belize here uh, just earlier this year with a brick press but we learned that by using effective techniques for brick building, um, we had a chain going where we would lay each brick in a few seconds. We had uh, people plastering, people mixing mud, actually mixing cement. And with the stops for the bricks, um, the, the workflow was such that if we continued that, we would build this entire uh, 12 by 12 structure here in three hours. We didn't do three hours. It took us all day to get the walls up. But but because of some details like oh we couldn't really get the forms moving up effectively but we know for next time but point is if you work out the the workflows in an effective way you can do tr tremendous things with a group of people so that was the finish of the build 
in Belize. Uh, okay, so the other thing we talk about is product ecologies. So we have our machines that build machines, like starting with 3D printers that make larger CNC torch tables. So you can print parts, as I mentioned, for the universal axes that are larger. You can then use the the CNC torch table to make other machines, and then you can build houses. So there's whole product ecologies that we talk about as far as an effective way to tame technology towards human human adaptability. We also build greenhouses, like this aquaponic greenhouse here. That's uh, That was a, uh, a three-day build of the first aquaponic greenhouse, where that's, that's what it looked like in prime time with the aquaponic tilapia in there, lettuce growing, and 10,000 nut plants that we have planted out, and then got most of them got eaten by rabbits. But it's another story. Um, so with with modular design and open source design, you can start beginning to talk about lifetime design and circular economies, which are otherwise impossible if you have black boxes that you cannot fix and see how they work. So in our in our package of 50 tools uh, that we're open sourcing, you can you can have like the grinder shredder sh shred up your cars, tractors, and appliances back to raw steel and molten plastic that you can then reform reformulate into virgin steel with metal rolling or into reusable 3D printing plastic using 3D printers that you can then machine and, and reuse in a circular loop so that you're in a highly efficient um, circular economy. This all led us to believe that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale, and that's what we're pushing to the limits. Um, and you can also do crazy things like uh, aluminum extraction from clay. We haven't done this yet, but the point is that out of common materials like like sunlight rocks plants soil water you've got all the resources for building building the things in civilization and uh clay is super abundant it's aluminum is one of the most abundant elements and then um imagine you could extract it by using energy and known chemical processes electrochemical processes to do that yeah you can do that and then you can show that uh, the limits of what 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 technology can do on a small scale. So for us, it's to show that even on a 40 acre parcel, you can you have all the resources and energy required to build a modern civilization. So that's kind of like how we frame it. Let's let's create this uh, starter kit for how you would do that uh, for the ends of pushing the, the limit of technology to complete human access that we transcend artificial scarcity, which is a dominant paradigm in today's world with the, the wars and resource conflicts and, and deprivation of many people where the abundant Abundance is really there, but we need to learn how to use it. So high tech allows us to do crazy things. Like you can look up on YouTube how you make this air bearing lathe, even which allows you to make semiconductor building equipment or rocket ships at the end of the day. So there's really no limit we believe that there is for technology. So, uh, but the next frontier in open hardware is um, for us is the learnings over the last decade. Uh, so in 2006 we got the land here, started building different projects and all the stuff you've seen. Um, but the one thing we haven't cracked yet is we have seen efficient building, we have seen low cost, we have seen efficiencies of all kinds, but the enterprise development is the whole new front at the end of the day. And we're applying all our learnings today to, to take this kind of a house. So this is our CD eco home. Uh, we're taking this to a thousand square foot model that we're releasing as a product release next year. And we're organizing a big event around that. Um, and framing it in the in the context of extreme enterprise. So, what is this extreme enterprise thing? It's the idea that we so so the let's talk about the 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 missing link and and what we've observed in in all of open hardware, and that is it's like a thousand times more difficult to to develop hardware than software, and you can never get the energy, or it's really difficult to get all that energy happening in a model that's that's like a social model without a highly hierarchical, well-funded organization. So our our goal is to show that, well, you can actually do that if you're really smart about it and, and have the proper incentives and then release everything in an open source. So we start with the concept of distributive enterprise saying, okay, well, first of all, we're gonna release everything that we, we develop on the enterprise front. So not only the, the blueprints for the machines, but also for the actual enterprises that arise from the machines let's let's distribute that and make it open source so that's our we talked about this the the concept of an open source business model that arises from uh from hardware and then you could think okay well if we're all collaborating and releasing the, the plans as open source well shouldn't there be people participating in that and would we be able to get massive participation if 
if we set big goals and, and take on ambitious projects that are worthwhile to everybody. Uh, in practice, that's a difficult challenge, uh, but we have, have, have done some milestones that are making us think that we can actually solve it. So first of all, uh, we've seen that in our, we've seen an economic model arise from what, what we're doing in the form of immersion education slash production workshops that we run. So for example, if you go to one of, you can sign up for one of our workshops where we will build a brick press or a tractor in like a day or a few days. And we charge people for those events and we also sell the machines so you can actually have a meaningful revenue model come out of that all based on open hardware. So that's one model that we're, we're doing. Like for example, selling the brick press for 5,000 over the bill of materials. Um, so that means uh, the brick press itself is about $5,000 in materials. So we sell that for 10K and then we charge people for tuition for this immersion uh, learning experience where they actually build the whole thing. Uh, from being completely inexperienced at the very beginning, we, we teach people how to weld and do different things, and then they can get onto more advanced tasks. But that's a revenue model that works, this workshop education model. So we've done that for 3D printers where we can build like say 12 printers in a day and charge people say $300 over the bill of materials. We've done that. Um, so there, there are some revenue models that work for the house. Uh, we charge people for the admission to, to do the actual building where they get an immersion experience on all this where we raised 25K from the 50 people that showed up for it. And our goal is now to make it into a viable product that people can can build themselves or as a small small team. Now, we did it with 50 people, but that's gonna, gonna be kind of hard for somebody to find 50 people. So we have to shift that to, to a manageable model. And our goal here is um, when we set out on this, it was to, to create a house that cost $70,000 um, that we're actually selling to people. So that's that's the part that we're working on and actually probably doing a little better than that. So that's that's the concept model of this house, it's off grid. But um, so let's talk about, um, uh, so with housing, we're, we're getting into the idea of how do we get enough participation to take this product to, to the finish line? Well, first of, first of all, we've done some groundwork that says, okay, this is doable. The, the build can be very efficient uh, we can use open source tools like, I don't know if anyone of you uses Sweet Home 3D. This was completely done in Sweet Home 3D uh, using its technical design capacity by basically par parametric modeling in there. So I don't think anybody else but us uses Sweet Home 3D for actual technical design, but we did it and it was actually a completely accurate technical model. Uh, so we use open source tools, but the point is that throughout our project and throughout most projects, it's a lot of times a uh, heroic effort by a small crew of people. And we're, we're trying to change that. And our response to that is to follow what, what uh, Linus has done with Linux. So uh, the le lesson from Linux that we can take is that uh, his initial goal, Linus Torvalds, when he released Linux, his goal was very clear as far as getting a viable working product in rapid time so that so that it can be used and it can be developed by people with economic interests. And that's what happened. So in about a year from his announcement, he had a basic minimum viable product that grew. So from 1991 uh, to 2010, that's the lines of code that increased. But basically after about a year, there was enough development on the kernel, the Linux kernel, that it was releasable as a product and, and companies started to fund it. So cool. How do you do that with hardware though? If it's, if it's a, so you can say software. Yeah, this is what they did. They got now, uh, this is like 2004, 2020. You got about 2000 full-time developers. They're actually not volunteers. They're all paid by companies like Microsoft and, and Google and Apple. Uh, it started completely voluntary, but once the money started flowing, so did the uh, support which is extremely recent because even a few years ago, Microsoft was calling Linux a cancer to its business model, uh, which has <laughs> quickly changed because right now, uh, over the last three years, uh, Microsoft became the leading contributor to open source product projects, open source software. Can you believe that? When I look at that through the history, like how you know I saw Microsoft when my brother even works for Microsoft, and um, I saw its history where they were Linux haters and now they're the number one supporter. That's that's amazing. But uh, for hardware, it's much harder because I think that hardware is actually like a not like 10 times harder. It's not even 100 times harder. I think it's actually about a thousand times harder 
than software to develop a working product of because you've got the hardware costs and labor and not just pushing electrons around on a keyboard, but you've got much more uh, investment involved with hardware and molecules that cost a lot of money. And what we think is that, hey, when you, when you do bug fixes in, in software, it's very much similar to hardware. Uh, in software, you might go through 10, 100, 000, 000 thousands of changes on, on in your Linux kernel, and you you have to do the same in in hardware too. Like you can go forever to making improvements, and and this little thing is wrong, or it can be better, and so forth. So it's you can go through so many prototypes. It's not like one, two, or three prototypes. It's literally like dozens or hundreds that you have to go through. Is more accurate. Even from our work, I mean, we see that it's like our 3D printers. It's like we still keep making changes and fixing stuff and getting better performance, lower cost, better buildability. The, the number of steps there is is infinite. Now, we haven't been able to get 2,000 people to show up yet. The best we were able to do, this is a graph from 2013, was 20, so 100 times less. This is design sprints that we used to hold, um, collaborative design, where we, use, we, we work on the module-based design to make things happen. But no, you can't get the numbers. So, we we are kind of hobbling along to completion like and this is the state of completion of the various machines comparison between 2014 2018 we're about one third done and we do have the module based design where we break down all the steps but how do we get to those levels where you got 2000 people participating in in crazy design uh, build events that's actually our exactly our goal and we're framing this within the, the framework of this this extreme enterprise model so that's that's what what I'll talk about pretty much um, that's our major effort for next year but based on the learnings we're saying hey we got to get enough people enough resources to take the product to completion because uh, the standard way is you get VC capital you get loans you get um, the corporate structure where you can get money from people um, through the the corporate structure mechanism of how you have the say the initial product offering initial whatever initial public offering ipos um all that stock market stuff and all that there's proven ways that you can get funding uh which started like in history i think that started with the dutch like in the 1400s or so uh, we got the corporate form but we're saying hey let's do something different let's do a public thing where we're actually crowdsourcing all this in a different way so we don't end up with this concentration of capital but instead a fully distributed model so right now we can't we can't really get like any buy-in from um like people if you talk about capital venture capital uh if you say open source no that i don't think it would fly i mean we've kind of tried we, we were never successful in getting money but at the same time uh, I'm not sure we would want to because there's a fundamental division there, philosophically speaking, where where the owners are not, you know, there, you have a fundamental conflict of interest beca between people who put in money, who just want money back, and the people who actually run the business who want to do things right. There's this fundamental conflict of interest. So, okay, let's let's find a way to address the funding. And that's what we're trying to do with this extreme enterprise model. We're saying, okay, let's get a bunch of people to fund it and develop it and make it work. So how are we gonna do this? Our model is basically uh, uh, surrounds the idea that we do hold this very massive, crazy development event, like a big startup camp hackathon kind of a thing where we're inviting 2000 people, that's our goal. And we think we're pretty confident that we can break down the role architecture and, and the development process into many, many steps based on the modular design of the house itself, all the different one one on the design front you have like say 10 different modules of the house people can work on and then the, on the enterprise front we're actually going to be spending a lot of that time during this development event developing the enterprise as aspects of the of the thing so from business planning to to marketing assets to to business business plan to all the other elements business process development how do you do that um so Yes, we can break down the pro process into many, many steps. We can involve a lot of people, but how do we get them to sh show up? Well, we think the best way to show up is that, hey, if you participate in this, you're, you're first in line to get one of these houses. And our, uh, we have a design right now that's uh, the package is $50,000 for a thousand square foot house that you can't, can build with a friend in one week. Crazy. So that's that's what we're, we're doing. Um, we're we're trying to solve for people showing up to make this happen because the reward is significant everyone who participates is there as a direct stakeholder interested in the house 
So how does this look like? Um, it, there's a little catch to it in that in this modular design. How do you build a thousand square foot house in a week with a friend, like from a kid that we drop ship to you? That's a pretty ambitious thing, but we're paying extreme attention to the absolute simplicity, buildability. We're the designer, builders, users of this, so we kind of know how you got to design things to be buildable and rapidly buildable. So the basic package is you have to bring your own land. That's that's the catch. I mean, as does the fifty thousand doesn't include land, but there's uh, I'll talk about that on Zillow.com in the United States. United States has got plenty of land. You can get lots for it from two to five thousand dollars pretty readily and just about anywhere. Just Google Zillow.com and see from land from low to high. You'll find plenty of lots. Not a problem in this country, but it might be a problem in other countries. Maybe not in Spain where they're selling entire villages. Uh, depends where you are. So if you're flexible, you can you can do this. Idea is um, it's forty thousand dollars in materials, and we charge ten thousand dollars for a support package of training, dropship delivery, and walking you through this entire process so you succeed, including preparing the the package for the code officials and all of that. Um, so that's that's the basic idea. Now, um, so forty thousand. How do you can you do that? Thousand square feet for forty thousand dollars? Well, yeah. Um, we're calculating that each 256 square foot module costs about 6K in materials. Concrete is two to five cents per pound. Wood floor roof is a dollar a square foot in general if you use the lowest cost techniques. But at the same time, so, okay, let's say we can do the price. Also the utilities though. How do you do the utilities? Um, it's the utilities I think are the, the hard part here, uh, but we have a design based on um, we use a modular utility panel and super simple way to build it. I can get into more details if anyone wants to do that. But the whole utility package costs about eight thousand in this in this whole thing, and it's buildable super rapid. So we're paying extreme attention to the ease of build. And this this house is actually going to be. We were thinking about helical piers like like pop up house, but we decided on a concrete slab for various reasons. One of them is cost and expandability. Because one of the big features of this thing is it's an expandable seed eco home. Okay, uh, expandable meaning you can expand up. It's actually got a flat roof. So actually, how is it gonna look uh, here? Let's, this is actually what it's, this is some initial concept renderings, but that's that's the initial thousand square foot module. This is expanded with some with a section in between and on top of the roof. And, and if you think about it, it's, it's a, super simple building methodology where you can go up to three stories you can have any kind of configuration that you like um so that's that's some of the initial concepts but um let's talk about the um yeah other costs so let's talk about the cost because 40k for materials you got to get land okay that's not included utilities they're going to cost you some uh for to connect to the grid it's going to cost you a bit of money maybe depending where you are between maybe a couple of thousand to 20,000 maybe. Uh, so there is some extra costs, uh, but it, there's also a huge case for going solar. Like in the house, this, this house here, we're actually off grid solar. We've got three kilowatts of solar on this. So there's definitely a case for uh, solar energy. And if you go to sunelect.com right now, you'll see that they sell container loads of PV panels for 29 cents, brand new. Norwegian panels for, for 29 cents a watt. I mean, most people don't recognize how inexpensive solar is today, but we're making um, the solar system, solar PV, a standard feature that you can order with this house. Uh, so getting involved. So let's talk about the tools. FreeCAD, Sweet Home Blender. FreeCAD actually is cool because you can do this. So we work between Sweet Home and FreeCAD right now, and we've got some Blender animations. But FreeCAD is super cool because it's open source extensible, and there's this very simple way you can do automated BOM, uh, BOMs in it, bills of materials, by using a part part tree with every single part broken down. Then you can select the part tree and run a macro to generate a CSV of all the parts, which essentially is your bill of materials. So I can talk more about that if you like. But FreeCAD, because it's open source, if, if that functionality didn't exist, we can create better functionality for uh, automated generation of bills of materials. Because that's going to be one of the challenges when you design all kinds of different configurations. How, how do you not spend all the time in the world as the architect des devising BOMs uh, for this? So this is your... BIM stuff here. 
uh, coming out of FreeCAD. Sweet Home is uh, which is what we actually use for the original designs, and you can interoperate by exporting uh, OBJ, just mesh formats, which is not the best, but you, you can export mesh formats from Sweet Home into FreeCAD that you can interoperate between FreeCAD and Sweet Home. So basically by designing whole part libraries with full version histories, we can manage this and also manage a larger scale collaborative process. So I mentioned about this crazy 2000 person design sprint or enterprise sprint. Uh, yes, there's. believe me, there's plenty of tasks you can allocate between all the open source tools, the modular design and so forth, which can allow a large team, just like in software, to collaborate seamlessly using very basic processes of version control and part libraries that we are developing various tool chains for. So it's really cool. Like this, the software is there in my view. Um, and FreeCAD is, uh, we have a way that we can teach people in one hour to do a basic workflow that gets you 80% of any possible design. So you can te also teach these tools quite effectively. Uh, we haven't done that for Blender yet because Blender is a little more complicated, but I also think you can learn Blender rapidly for the basic functionality uh, if you can, if you want to do animations and renderings. Now, the cool thing about this is we, we're extensible to all kinds of systems. So I mentioned about the PV system. In, in this house, we actually have a biodigester that, that creates, um, this is the only uh, tempered zone house with a with an indoor biodigester in the world perhaps i don't know if anyone else does that we're we're emitting gray water for septic fertigation as a byproduct for on the wastewater system in this house the, uh, that's one of the systems we have also built a pool very low cost it's like two thousand bucks in materials uh for a not very nice pool we're gonna offer so the pv is going to be a standard offer uh we're involving other crazy areas based on our machine work, the 3D printing work, where we're building larger printers where you can actually start printing trim and, and whole building panels. So that's that's something that will be released in this whole process as well. And um, there's machines, there's a relationship to machines here because the tractors can be used, the, some of the open source tractors can be used to lower the construction costs. And you can get into things like aquaponic greenhouses, like I, I showed, that's gonna be also an option you can get with a house for food production, or you can do farm bots, et cetera, to do, to do various stuff. What's this hydrogen crazy thing here? Well, we're actually gonna <laughs> uh, have a, a, an experimental hydrogen, solar hydrogen production set up as well. You can see that the first ever solar hydrogen demonstrator house was built in 2006 in the United States, actually. Um, yeah, unique properties. This is a big, hairy, audacious goal. But if you talk about hydrogen even, uh, PV is not expensive, but you can't store it. You, the best bet is probably uh, forklift batteries, in my opinion. Uh, you can go to lithium ions, but they're a disaster in terms of environmental and social aspects. So I don't really, like I look, man, I was gonna get, get into that, but after I read a little more about the environmental and social issues involved with that, it's like, they're not super recyclable. It's a finite resource and it's it's not the greatest. So I would favor lead acid batteries in, over over that. But that leaves the energy question because this thing is not doesn't have energy solved. It has PV for daytime, but what do you do for nighttime? You can connect to the grid with like net metering, but uh, I think the real deal is solar hydrogen and a lot of people, if you look at, if you start Googling solar hydrogen, you'll notice a big spike of interest in it as everybody's talking about uh, circular economies and renewable energy these days. Uh, but the first solar hydrogen house prototype demonstrator was built in New Jersey in the United States in 2006 or seven. There's one that's being built right now in the UK in 2020. So, and we're gonna offer the first first in the world open source hydrogen system. Uh, you can do it, okay, you have the PV that's affordable. You can do electrolysis using alkaline electrolysis and you can store the gas in, high, in, uh, in propane tanks at relatively low pressure. So there's a tool chain where you can do it. Now, now uh, how do you burn it? Uh, we're not gonna use fuel cells. We're gonna use internal combustion engines. Think of like the Honda EU 1000 generator that's converted for hydrogen, something of that effect where you're still burning it because that's technology that's accessible today. And that, that understandably could be very controversial to a lot of people who will be like, that's nuts, you're gonna burn hydrogen. But right now we do have the technology to burn hydrogen in, in internal combustion engines. So we're actually gonna uh, look into that as an option that's gonna be an experimental feature that you can order with this house. Like I've looked at the, uh, spec'd out some of the, 
the pricing. There's going to have to be an open source electrolyzers because that's uh, uh, those are rather well, a bit expensive right now. Um, but even if you go with an off the shelf electrolyzer, it could be almost affordable so that a system like this, we're aiming for about $5,000 for the hydrogen generation and use system. No fuel cells, just internal combustion engines. Uh, so in this project, we're taking on a BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal of not only solving housing that's affordable. How? Well, we're making it affordable and buildable. Um, buildable, absolutely. Speed and cost wise. And it has to be beautiful. We have a distributed enterprise model. So we're teaching entrepreneurs how to, how to build these houses as we develop this. And that's why we think we can get 2,000 people to show up because the value proposition is significant. Uh, other people can get involved in Blender, animations, renderings, and so forth, uh, different ways to collaborate in op using open source tool chains. But in this whole process, we're, we're trying to solve housing and we're, we're serious about it. We say, okay, let's, let's do the first ever affordable buildable house. What do we have to learn from history about it? There's been many attempts at that, right? Um, we're, we're yet another effort to solve it. I think we can, um, but I think the real key is being open source collaborative. Uh, if we're if we really get really good and successful, then we might solve hydrogen and and, and the plastic problem. If you if we develop open source uh, plastic recycling for making construction materials, kind of like uh, precious plastic but with three D printers. Um, let's learn from others. So let's look at history of why um, affordable housing has succeeded or not. Sears kit houses were a major, major success. I don't know if you guys have heard about them. In the United States, between 1908 and 1942, they were a major hit. They were a big success. A drop-shipped kit home that weighed 25 tons that they delivered on a truck to your, your, your steps before you had the house there, so you built the house from a kit. Guess why it, <laughs> guess why it ended? Uh, I was blown away. I just found this out yesterday. But the Sears kit houses stopped because they ran out of wood. In 1942, all the wood in the United States was repurposed to the war effort. And they shut down and never opened their doors again. Um, it was very interesting. But they had a whole whole uh, set of kits that they had to refund money for people because basically they couldn't get wood. So what's the lesson there? Control your supply chain. That's actually a big issue right now because I mentioned the $40,000 price for the, the lumber. Um, we we spec'd out two by six lumber at $6 a board for an eight footer in the United States. We just looked the other day, they're $10 now. Uh, prices of materials have gone up 80% right now. So the Sears kit failure <laughs> is actually a uh, quite relevant history for us because right now the, the price of lumber is essentially double. Uh, also due to the forest fires, the Trump embargo on Canadian wood imports, and just the general surge of building by yuppies fleeing the cities uh, during COVID time. That's interesting convergence of history right there. Uh, let's look at others. Katrina Cottages, if you ever heard of them. So actually in the presentation, the, those blues are clickable. So you can link uh, find out more about it. Um, Katrina cottages were pretty cool, but they kind of looked like a trailer home, so people didn't like them. They were not buildable because they were too expensive to build. Uh, the mobile in home industry was a, a kit house that was to be made by companies that are like the companies that make model kit, uh, the mo mobile homes. Uh, and the mobile home guys said, now nah, we ain't building this, it's too hard. So it wasn't super buildable, uh, too complex, which is, uh, um, I think we're addressing that quite a bit because we're the architects and builders and users and designers and engineers of this thing. So we actually like have the whole uh, chain of uh, design from design to finish kind of, you can say vertically integrated, uh, which leads into modular housing. If you click on that, there's a great article on why modular housing has failed. And basically, long story short, is that house building is a complex, intricate process with many parties involved and the, and because it's not integrated enough each guy tries to pass the buck onto the next guy the architect uh the average architect will make a house that is not designed to be built easily like unless you have built one the engineer will not design a house to be um, low cost because they're just following the uh, standards right uh, but basically, at each step, you have this break of 
the one agent or party passing it on to the next guy. Like for example, with the modular housing case, it was like the guys have some kind of a product that fits in a modular house and they say, okay, that's the end of my responsibility. You figure out how to put it into the rest of the house. That's kind of the way I understand it. Like the whole chain of command from uh, design to the finished product is so dis it disconnected that the price is just jacked up over that entire process. And you can read more about from, from that article uh, regarding why that is. Now, what do we learn from micro houses? Well, we built a micro house uh, here and we think that people need space. Like my, most micro houses are uh, temporary, i.e. people end up moving up out of them or they're not comfortable. If we lived in one here too, and it's like Katarina said, it's like, no way, it's too little space for a family. Uh, so make it big enough. So we're doing starting with thousand square feet. Now there's Vivi House. What do we learn from them? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Nothing. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just yep. wondering. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is in lots of different time zones, and some people might have other things that they need to do. Yep. Um, are you able to round Can up in maybe five minutes? So we've got ten yeah, minutes for questions. No, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm close. Let me just say, is, is there anybody who, who does actually need to, to go in the next quarter of an hour? Or can we just run over time? It doesn't sound like there's too much pressure. So, yeah, no, I'm, so just, I can wrap up here. This is, I was just going through some of the uh, learning. Yeah, cool. Some of that stuff is really interesting. And I want to ask you guys, because this is learning from others, like maybe the, the discussion point could be like, what do we learn from other projects? Why why there is not affordable housing today? Um, from from Wiki, okay, Vivi House, yes, they are open source. I, I believe personally that any effort that solves housing must be open source collaborative. So any kind of a proprietary effort is deemed to fail by design, I would say, in my opinion, because somebody's can't catch in more profit probably than they need to. Uh, so it has to be open source. Doesn't mean you're poor making these houses. You can make a lot of money too, but it's got to be open source. So everyone has access. Uh, there's other. Uh, so Vivi House, that's a great project to look at. They're the modular open source housing, uh, but you need a financing model for that. Wiki House is a bit expensive. Dimaxian House by Buxminster Fuller in US history. Uh, I, I don't know, it maybe didn't get accepted, be, even though it was su supposedly superior because it wasn't so humane. I think zero energy autonomous houses are a great idea. Yes, let's make them open source. Natural building, hey, we've done that. It's uh, labor is expensive, but that's the cordwood hut there that you see in that picture that um, since then we've moved up to a more traditional structure, but that's how we lived initially. And we experienced that to find out that yes, you can build it for 400 hours, but if you count your labor, it's 4,000, more like you know a few thousand dollars, uh, even though the labor might be like, uh, the even though the materials may be like almost uh, cost free. Um, and the hydrogen houses, yeah, solar hydrogen houses. Yeah, that's a cool idea, I think. But anyway, nobody's solved the, the housing package yet. Um, challenges, what are, so what are the challenges that we see here? Well, we've got a lot of development. I don't, I don't think the actual build of the house is going to be an issue. I think I actually crossed that out because I was thinking like, okay, can we build an affordable, attractive, uh, easy to build model? I think so. Uh, I think the enterprise aspect is the biggest one. How do you roll it out as an enterprise? Maybe the coordination of the 2,000 people in a development event, but we have a plan for that. If um, if we don't have 2,000 people, I think the minimum that it can work with is like 500 or even possibly 200 or something. It will take longer, but we're trying to go for the large numbers to just get it knocked out and done. And we've got a product next year. Um, now, the other issue is that house may be speculated upon. So say you build this house and now you can sell it because houses are worth a lot, right? You sell it for like, you start speculating with, with this open source house. Is that going to happen? Well, I don't know. It's probably, it definitely is going to happen. So we have to just provide enough of them that less speculation happens and everyone has, has access. These are some of the house models, designs. I don't know. So I, I think I'll end there. Maybe like the, the feedback I'd like to hear from you guys is like, okay, how do we succeed in making affordable housing for everybody? And what do we learn from projects maybe that we have missed? So I'll, I'll end there. You have the presentation. You can contact me there and all of that. Uh, maybe open this up to housing right now. <laughs> Questions. Thank you. Really cool. Thanks. Yeah. I just mentioned one thought, any from, one thought from Denmark in terms of avoiding speculation. There are 
there are housing systems here where you you, you don't own the building you own mm -hmm. your part of a cooperative so you yeah. buy the rights to the building and it's always the cooperative that sets the price mm. that's, that's one model that they use here in denmark yeah that that would definitely be worthwhile to look at uh, is that something you can send a link to for their model? I mean, we'd love to, we've thought about something like that where if we're selling the house, maybe we can allocate part of that funding to managing a common. So basically you, you buy the, as you said, rights to that house and there's something in the, in the contract that says you're not, basically you can only sell it at an affordable price after yourself. You can still make improvements so that wouldn't dis disincentivize improvements, but there would be some, it's kind of out of the scope of this discussion, but let's talk about it afterwards. I'd, I'd love to explain how we do it here in Denmark. Yeah, okay. That'd be great. What questions do we have? Turn on your camera if you've got a question so we can smile at each other. It's really interesting. It's, you've got some nice graphics as well. I see you went in and painted everything black and gave it some orange stripes. It's good looking. Uh, what? I uh, just saying the presentation itself, there's a, there's a, some nice posters there of, of what things look like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you referring, were you referring to the house model itself in, in uh, Sweet Home 3D or? No, the, the posters of, uh, of all the machines you've been working on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's a graphic from a long time ago. Yep. Can I have a question? I just want to understand a little bit better. Uh, when you are yeah. talking about the, the 2000 people event, let's say yeah. 500, uh, these would be people that eventually would uh, would be trained how to construct, let's say, and would they yep. eventually get a house, something like that? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so we're trying to solve for people showing up, and we think that if we say, "Hey, you're actually uh, you're you're participating," because you not only this is not a hackathon. This is like you're directly involved, not only uh, designing and finishing and, and productizing a house that you're going to get, but also something that contributes to greater humanity. So we're trying to combine the two. It's like you're personally interested in this because you've got a house that you're going to get. And two, you're actually contributing to a bigger global effort that solves bigger problems by making this accessible to everyone. But does this mean that this uh, group of 2,000, let's say, people or whatever the number is, uh, let's say, is from uh, the same area where, let's say, they're going to be? Oh, yeah. Because this is kind of difficult, let's say, you know, to, to think about software. Uh, we can talk yes. about uh, every part of the planet. Somebody can contribute. Why no, this is actually a, a remote event because in, we're still in COVID. It's, and this is this is planned for August of next year, by which COVID is probably maybe we have less restrictions. There probably will be some COVID stuff going on in August, but we're thinking it's a remote event, so you can collaborate using online tools, use like this um, with a big big conference, and we have to structure that the role architecture for that and subgroups and all that. But the idea there is do it in like one weekend where it's twenty four hours in one weekend, so it's manageable for people to. To just show up to that and it, there's training like there's a crash course of four hours right now that we're planning so you bring people on board how do you actually document your work that you put in a proper version history and part library like what are all the different steps so we teach you the basics here's the the large-scale collaborative development method here's some basic tools like freecad sweet home and blender here's um just how you collaborate in this overall design process, the, the collaborative literacy mindset, the fact that it's even possible to do that. Most people don't recognize that there's the tools or techniques to do that. So it's an education for the people that go in there. How do you do modular, uh, open source, modular development? Um, so that's also a valuable thing for people because we want the people afterwards and during to contribute to further improvements as well. Okay, okay. Just quick question Last. here. Uh, oh, sorry, that's okay. You go ahead. Uh, oh, um, sorry. Can you hear me? Just yes, yes. Um, I, so I, I'm very intrigued by the, this. One thing I've seen in the U.S. that works is a uh, land trust where they have, where you know the a organization purchases the land, and then you know you your then that 
you know, you have a 99 year lease or whatever. And then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that, I think that would be a, a potentially a way to get around the land and also a way to coordinate with planning. Cause that's, you know, you're, you're excited about houses, right? As, yeah. as more on the planning side, I'm, it makes me nervous seeing like, okay, all these uh, 5,000, $5,000 lots, where are they? What are the consequences of that, et cetera, right? So that's an issue, but that's a stepping stone. I think the real deal is village building. So we have the larger concept, like in the global village construction set, as that implies, uh, we'd like to build campuses, which are essentially facilities where you have education, production, real life. So basically like the, the way to build, think of it instead of the 40 acre cookie cutter development, you're saying this is a development where it's cluster development, you have agricultural production, natural preservation, production. So kind of the fab cities idea where cities now begin to produce all that they consume and biological wastewater treatment and all that, like an aquaponic greenhouse, the biodigester work, the PV, like, yeah, we can, we already can do quite a bit for autonomous energy and food and waste production systems. So that's the greater vision, cluster development. Right now we're starting with just the single homes, but we'd like to do the larger larger settlements for us it's about um we'd like to build kind of like the university that i mentioned i went to university and i wasn't particularly satisfied with that uh, we'd like to create an environment which is like a place of lifelong learning like a university campus but it's like where you live there for real so that kind of a model but definitely land trusts and and one thing that i've been thinking about a lot around this is uh you know climate refugees and where are the climate refuge refuges for people, right? And how do you how do you start thinking about those as part of this too? Which would be really interesting. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I think the basic techniques for construction, like especially if you start adding the compressed earth block machine into this, we did not release the first model as a CEB version. It's much more labor, much more capital intensity there. Um, even though the building material is is almost free. Uh, there's a lot of labor and, and an intricacy to that process, but we are definitely rolling that out as uh, if we get enough orders, we invest that revenue into first things, get the brick press into full production, get the sawmill into full production as in a CNC sawmill that you can generate lumber from where, whatever site you have so you don't rely on Canada or whole forest plantations and stuff like that. Um, so definitely think about how you incorporate local materials like the plastic or earth or lumber that you source locally. Um, Duncan, I don't know if you want to uh, step in here about, um, you know, there's been talk around um, having some sort of project and we've talked about a mad scientist layer um, to demonstrate all the different um, workflows for, for Blender and Blender BIM and other oh, yeah. things. Um, and so I don't know if, if this kind of thing would be an interesting project to be part of. Yeah, uh, the, the idea of, with that project was um, we've got kind of a few things. One thing, uh, there's a few projects people are working on which are real world projects um, which are not particularly pressed for time. Um, and that's one way that's, that we're helping um, Blender BIM and FreeCAD push push development there. But the other one, some, um, like you talk about, um, first one, is um, the idea of a completely fictitious project, which just includes all sorts of, you know, as a display project, which includes all sorts of kind of different things. So I guess um, because what we've talked about is both in, in our group, our time and our resources are maybe not not set up so that we can guarantee things in, in somebody else's time frame. But certainly working, uh, the, the, there'd be some interest, I imagine, in people working on a, um, on a crazy project which just tries to cover all bases with all sorts of things. Like I was thinking um, an, an aspect to the project, uh, to the project you're doing there, Marcin, is, is okay, how do you handle the modularity and mm -hmm. nationalization of some of these things. Different places have got different requirements, different oh, yeah. lighting, all that kind of stuff. And and that could be an interesting thing to look at. Well, how can we in our software manage the aspects of a project um, 
and make it easy for people to say, well, you know, actually, if I need to add one extra bedroom or if I have mm -hmm. a great view over here, can I move my window there without ruining their structural integrity and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. um, so definitely um, have a think about whether there are some some things that you think we'd be able to use to, to push our development forward. And of course, we've got plenty of people with lots of professional skills. How many people are in your network? No idea. We have no way of tracking it at the moment. We haven't really, we haven't really got as far as saying this is who we are and who's with us. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, you just have to look at the forum and see how many people are talking. Yeah. In terms of forum users, we're now sitting at approximately 750. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, only a, a, a small fraction of that, I would say less than 10% uh, actually actively uh, view what's going on. Um, and then an even smaller fraction of that are people who actually contribute and build stuff and test stuff and use stuff. And it's kind of like the whole long tail graph you tend to see in most organizations, uh, open source organizations, where a very small number of people do the work and then um, there's a longer tail of people who are uh, encouraging, but uh, due to various uh, limitations in time and so on, it, it becomes complicated. Out of curiosity, just one more thing. Just Back, to, I had a question about your, because um, you were talking about funding and scaling. Um, have you considered partnering with humanitarian organizations? Because, yeah. for example, with you know refugee planning, you know you you have one week where you have a whole bunch of skilled people in a room, and you say in one week you're going to get two thousand people arriving on this plot of land, and you need to have basically a mini village set out for them. I know it's it's much more bare bones. Like they, they say, okay, this many people have this amount of water we need to provide, this amount of shelter we need to provide, this this many square feet per person. And they have standards for all that type of stuff. So they've already worked out like really minimum livable standards before people start uh, turning into refugees. And they've also, I assume, worked out um, I guess you're after something a bit more permanent and empowering, whereas they're just after temporary and getting it over the line. But maybe there's there's something there. Yeah, no, haven't haven't really talked to any of the humanitarian organizations like that. We're trying to get in contact with Habitat for Humanity, see if there's interest. So we'll do that as part of the outreach. Uh, do you have any specific contacts that you can forward on to who could be interested? Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got some people who have worked for organizations like the UN who do refugee planning and are well versed in the um, in the standards involved in that. Do you think like so? If ours is a more permanent solution, what would you see that would be relevant to the refugee camps? I think probably some of the utility systems that we're we're developing, like waste processing or or PV, perhaps. Or or maybe after, like the refugee camp would be a stopgap, you know, a stepping stone to something else. And then mm. you're, you would provide the next step if they do need to set up their own community. I, I'm not sure. I, I have absolutely yeah. no experience in this process, but uh, maybe there is something there to look at. I, I can probably connect you to uh, somebody who, who knows much more about this. Yeah. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind, that would be great. How, how do we uh, follow up through this? Oh, I have your email. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. oh, or on the forum. I'll do it on the forum so everybody it's, everybody can see what's going on. Yep. Another another aspect of what you've been talking about is, as you say, it's putting more focus. If if I understood you correctly, you're making more use of people's um, time and effort rather than expensive solutions and complicated solutions that only uh, perhaps more trained and more skilled people can deal with. Um, and there was some talk here uh, when we had some refugees arrive from Syria of helping of helping them through a training funding land uh, lease model build some communities so that they would be able to have an area of land and they would get some training and they would be able to to, to build their own community. Um, I don't think anything happened about that, but that's certainly a, another way where what Dion's saying can be the, the natural follow on to a temporary refugee situation where people actually need somewhere to settle down for at least some number of years. Hmm. Yeah, that would be, that would be something. But what, what do you think, um, what are you guys missing in terms of the functionality or the, the capability of, of what's going on in the software world? Because one of the things we, another of the things we haven't 
sort of done at the moment, people are developing what they, they themselves need. Um, and maybe one of the things we want to look in the future is, is sort of a priority list of what, what do the people out there um, need of, of support for certain functions or file formats or whatever. What are you guys seeing as, as, a, as a whole and what you need for software? Mm. Automatic generation of the bills of materials that you can cust customization and bill of material generation. Right now, our simple approach to that is, okay, we can teach you some free CAD and, and sweet home. And from the modules that we already have in extensive part libraries, you can do that. What we were planning on doing is we actually, uh, one of our guys wrote, uh, uh, it's called the OSC workbench platform in free CAD where you can start designing workbenches in FreeCAD for all the machines. So we've got one for our 3D printer, for example. We are planning on creating one for the house where you drag and drop known modules into your working document. So just that kind of integration where you're populating a, a package like FreeCAD with all the modules so that you, you effectively create to creating essentially that workbench, creating that workbench for FreeCAD, we've got a, a bunch of instructionals. Maybe I can follow up on a, on a forum uh, regarding the OSC Workbench platform and how that works. But basically, we've got the whole workflow well defined for how you actually program FreeCAD in Python for any Python programmers out there, so that they can get involved in it. And that's, that I think is going to be a big part of the the customization of how customization and popular involvement which we haven't achieved so much yet. But once people can start designing their own houses that are buildable, that's going to be much better. So filling in the gaps on the design capacity would be that. And then from there, of course, get to the automated bill of materials generation. Yeah, I know if the data is there, I know that what Dion has been doing with IFC and Blender BIM can also, can also fill that hole in um, automatic build of quantities but that's that would be through the ifc format for building um, the other macro that you mentioned for freecad does that have a name can we find that on the internet somewhere or is it part of freecad or yeah the thing that i referred to let's see um I guess I'm just asking other are the, are the, the other developers of FreeCAD well aware of that. Right. So uh, let's see the, the link there that I have in. Um, I can follow up. I thought I had the link in there. It's. Um, let me send you a link right now, which is simply. That'd be great, and then we can just we can just check ourselves that the FreeCAD people. Uh, know that there's a there's something there uh, so that's the this is a simplistic macro i just put a link to it and then there's the osc workbench platform uh, so take a look at the second one the second link there that's that's pretty good stuff um where I think it's Correct. perhaps the most comprehensive documentation of how you actually start to program FreeCAD to make workbenches. That that kind of info is scattered. I think we've got the most comprehensive uh, instructionals on how to do that there, that we know of at least. So OSC FreeCAD workbenches. How do you do, actually start designing workbenches within FreeCAD? Yeah, so yeah, there could be tons of Python and FreeCAD people involved in this and we'd want to generate relationships with a lot of architects who are doing this customization work so we'd like to inv involve a lot of people who develop this capacity so it could be standard architects it could be open source people who learn the software um that's part of the business problem to work out for rolling out these houses one of the things of um do some other people have some questions? Yes. Uh, about the, I understand that uh, in the US, uh, there is a lot of land and you need to build houses. 
but uh, as you said in Europe uh, there is many village which are very inexpensive because uh, they, some are almost desertic and uh, to solve the house issue we also need to talk about rehabilitation or renovation I don't know how you say it um, and currently as much as I know uh, it costs less energy to do renovation than to build a new house so I don't know if you plan to a project about this or you first go for the new house and uh, you think about renovation later yeah I mean um, we we know that our take on that is yeah to to renovate an existing thing it's for us it's probably lower cost definitely faster possibly lower lower energy to build from scratch because we've got we think what we have is a very basic building method so we haven't we're, we're not touching the remodeling right now um so i don't have much comment about that but um but if you do have a building that's already standing there of course you wouldn't want to tear it down one thing that could be done is maybe use some of our techniques for either like modular additions or modifications like you can certainly retrofit some of our subsystems like say pv or say the aquaponic greenhouse to adding them on to existing structures we definitely do think about infill development like for example in a city you might have one lot in a burned down neighborhood that's just there for building so that would be uh, but that's still new construction so so that is definitely um because we are so unique uh i mean unique as in like we're not we know that our technique it's a completely different skill set to build what we're doing than to say renovate something from that's already standing so it's kind of different packages yeah some other questions yeah um i'm not trained in mep or structural but this is an mep and structural question so um i'm you use it seems as though, from my understanding, for your purposes, the existing open source software is plenty capable of um, delivering, uh, the, you know, uh, doing a basic blocking, massing diagram, drawing out each individual part. That already exists. But what about the engineering side? I mean, are you? How do you do your um, uh, M MEP calculations? How do you do your structural analysis? Do you use open source software for that, or do you it do it old school and just say, okay, you know, we'll just, we'll just work it out um, by hand. And um, yeah, right now it's old school as in, okay, here's the structure design of the interface between panels here, engineer, verify this and show us some of the detail or what we need to do. So we get it certified. This is non-standard construction. So it has to be engineered. So we're just hiring an engineer to do that. And but because it's a modular construction method, like once we get a few basic engineering calculations done, then we're we're good for more. But of course, this is where all the open source engineering software could come in. We haven't used that at all yet. But if there's expertise within this community on that, which I think there is plenty, uh, yeah, definitely would be points of collaboration. Okay, so let's get the thermal and structural and all kinds of analysis done in FreeCAD, Salome, and uh, open whatever BRL cat or whatever we've got out there open foam uh, there's a ton of stuff that I'd love to see uh, all that functionality migrate slowly but surely into FreeCAD that would be awesome and I think that's going to happen over time and perhaps we can fund some of that with the revenue from this project maybe make that um, a fast track to getting some of that capacity because we definitely love to have it in an open source right now we're just getting it whichever way we can I know here in Denmark, you won't be able to build anything until you've got some pretty good documentation for all sorts of stuff, including the thermal. Yeah. It makes yeah. it hard because it has to be calculated also in a very specific way and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so local adaptation and, and 
and that kind of a capacity that we develop as part of the source code in this project where we teach people so okay how do you do this what's required for each localization um for localization wise because right now we're starting with the us but we'll be going to of course this will spread to other countries so yeah how do we do that so the localization questions is a big one sure yes um I think you know EarthChip principle. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are the very interesting airflow management and the water management. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you talked about water management before, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is inspired from uh, EarthChip or something? Uh, not ex exactly. Uh, EarthShip is also very expensive and proprietary and not easy to build. <laughs> um, it's not an open source project to begin with, but the more inspiration comes from another, even more unopen source project, which is called um, Living Machines, right? But the aquaponics, the picture that you, I showed in my presentation is for real. The stuff is amazing and it works. And we figured that out, how to do that tower, do the towers. So we've got that part. Uh, personally, I was inspired a lot by Living Machines in this and then seeing some of the other aquaponics work. Um, we are aware of Earthship. If they were more open source and collaborative, we could probably work more with them. <laughs> don't have, don't they have uh, open plan? Nah, -uh. <laughs> sorry. Because no, I think no, they don't. Like you look at, take, download one of their models from them, and it's it's copyrighted. It's it's not open source. You can't use those plans. You have to pay for them and so forth. Um, this kind of brings up the other question like a lot of times yeah i mean for me like i've studied a lot of this okay who's open source and who's not what you'll find out is that once there's an actual really good working design it's super rare to find an, any open source version like for the aquaponics the stuff that we did was previously pretty much proprietary by uh, this other company and we had not a lot to go on outside of other people that we're doing similar work, but a lot of times just all this stuff gets sucked up and disappears. And uh, the general comment is that altogether is very little. If you talk about a, an efficient, good, solid design, it's very, very rare. Uh, there's only a few projects that have that. Maybe Axiom, the Vivi House, uh, FarmBot. Um, but no, there's a lot of stuff that looks open source, but is fake open source. And we have an article on that if you want to look at our wiki. But we, we ran into a lot of that where, you know, first of all, a lot of people are going to use the word open source, and they're not open source according to the definition. That's very common. So it's one of the issues of cultural uh, transformation that we need to address as we move forward in an open source economy. That's a really, really important point. And I think yeah. there's something because we're mainly focusing on the software side, uh, not so much hardware. There's something that we need to do about that too. Mm -hmm. Something about whenever we, even whenever we build stuff software wise, we need to open source the building process so that more developers can join in and, and get interested. And um, that's something I think we need to work on as a community. Absolutely, and that is exactly the thing that we're trying to address with the extreme enterprise concept. We're not just publishing the, the design of the house. We're publishing the business process and the very enterprise that we publish it for you. You can replicate it yourself. Now, also, we will train you to do that, and we will have a whole open source franchise model where we, we, we can train you, give you the rapid training on that. But we publish everything absolutely, and, and anyone can learn from it because we want to work on solving bigger problems. And that's... Uh, it's very rare that there's uh, anything resembling the distributive enterprise thing. I think we're the only guys in the world right now that are very deliberately talking about the idea of open sourcing business plans so that if you have a best practice like Apple, imagine Apple open sourcing their stuff so everyone gets up to the level of Apple or any best player allows everybody to raise the bar. That is the critical missing thing that is very rare, very, very foreign to people today. Because of course we live in decades, centuries of proprietary hardware starting in the industrial revolution. That cu culture is very strong for the last 200 years. Uh, and software had a different, little bit of a different break because the original software people 
they were actually open source. So, so that's why I think it happened faster in software as well. But in hardware, a lot of stuff, yeah, it's much more of a foreign topic. Like John Deere is not going to open source their tractors until we do. And then we, we show them that it's actually an economic advantage to go open source, which has been amply demonstrated by open software. But just people are not making that connection that the hardware could work the same too. And it's much harder in hardware agreed, but the exact same kinds of uh, methods of, of collaborative development for creating an open core that's still applicable just as much, even more. I'm thinking uh, maybe, uh, maybe half past we can round up, but I know Beshwine has another yeah. question. I have a question. Do you hear me? I have it, Rafael. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, ambitious as well, but you have the reputation that you are able to do this open source technology. So I think you can do it. Uh, the just uh, two questions. One is why you do you say that WikiHouse is expensive project? And um, and this because uh, I just thinking you know the uh, Jurik van Habert, he he built his uh, and uh, the WikiLab using FreeCAD as well with the WikiHouse concept behind that project and this uh, he built it. But uh, I would like to know what why you say that this is an expensive because I I was thinking that the concept of WikiHouse using you know CNC machines and all that thing this should go in the direction of make it cheaper. And the other thing yeah. is, uh, is what about the industrialization of houses uh, in, in your perspective with this, uh, this, uh, this project that you are, you, you are, you are designing? Uh, do, you, do you think that it's possible to move this into an uh, industrialized house, uh, build it in factories using FreeCAD? Yeah. So two questions for for WikiHouse. It's not particularly expensive, but it is expensive by our standards because we are aiming for a price of fifty dollars a square foot. Uh, their cost is one hundred fifty per square foot, if I'm correct. So it's three x our cost. For I think that was with respect to one of their like one of their older models. I'm not exactly sure what the exact cost structure is right now, but it's at least 3x more than what we're trying to do. And we have more features as in that actually includes the utilities and uh, utility systems. But by standard construction techniques, no, that's, uh, it could be lower, like 150. Um, that's the figure I'm kind of working. Do you, I mean, do you know the exact cost per square foot or per square meter figure for WikiHouse? No, no, I don't know. Yeah, so just Google that. And I will guarantee you that it will be between 3x and 10x our cost. So, yeah, um, it it is a really good question. And if the WikiHouse people, I don't I don't want them to, to get mad at me here. But WikiHouse cost per square meter. It says 325 per square meter. An immediate hit on the internet. Uh, 325 per square meter. What? No. Is it? If that is true, then it's the same cost as ours. Um, here, build cost 1,000 to 1,600 per meter squared. So yeah, so about like 110, 160 per square foot or so. Um, a little more than that. So yeah, it's. I mean, we're we're serious about a fifty dollar per square foot build cost. So so they're according to their official numbers, they're three x our cost. So you can say, well, that's that's good for for standard construction because it's still cheaper than standard, but it's not as as inexpensive as ours. So now, can this lend itself to industrialized production with FreeCAD? Hey, why not? Now, um, I think it's all a matter of how you do it. Uh, the thing that I want to be uh, cautious about is having ethical enterprise. You know, once you get into, you know, read Small is Beautiful by Schumacher, right? And find out that at a certain scale of operation, just things just break down. So 
the question of scale is important. If you can run that as a run a an industrial pro, or industrialized production, that would be great as long as that organization is highly collaborative and a good business that does things well for the environment and for people. That's fine. It can certainly you can certainly do that with with our method. I think. I think I I, I just was uh, I was uh, you know thinking that uh, you are you are working with uh, several areas of the technology that could help small factories you know small yeah. workshop to build yeah. houses that because because you already have you know all these incredible open source machines mm -hmm. and and then uh, open source methodologies and uh, yep. low cost you know process and method so and now you you can and as well you have these uh, business models that as well are open source so they can be maybe you know adopted by small workshops to use yeah. this machine to produce open source low cost houses and uh, it's, it's what I, I was thinking you know when I say industrialized I'm not talking about corporate uh, corporations yeah. you know it's, it's, it's a small or medium workshops uh, that in many countries you know this is where a lot of people work couldn't agree with you more that's uh... As long as we make the distinction between just like corporate and, and just foul business, no, this is absolutely industrializable by small scale micro factories. Absolutely. And, and to to follow that that line of thought a bit more, um, I know you are thinking of extreme enterprise as one big event. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm wondering if if that big event would benefit from like a groundswell of little activities involving um, small shops and um, people who like people here, for example, or other people mm -hmm. that you're talking to over time mm -hmm. that they can engage with um, the idea of the distributive enterprise and um, be part of a network and have little ways in which they can start bootstrapping and um and engaging with the idea be, be beyond just listening to you talk about it um as a way of building a groundswell that can then yeah. really push into um the extreme enterprise event the first one when it happens and then also um provide a network that can start to trigger the localization um that you we've identified as um being potentially problematic just yeah no think about yeah definitely no no you're right i think the the extreme enterprise event is going to be like the culmination but before that as soon as we launch which we're looking at like january 21st when the presidential transition occurs uh if we don't have a revolution we'll launch on january 21st so and at that time it would be a great because right now we're doing a lot of prep work and we're actually building two more models like right now in in November and December, including one that's in a different location to prove that you can actually do this with full codes, with uh, a business model that actually works and so forth. So, um, but yeah, definitely, I think the groundswell idea is absolutely right. So, uh, and that's why, you know, I'm doing this presentation here and keep talking about this and get people involved in, there's so many different elements that can be developed. There's the house technology and all the ancillary technologies, including 3D printing and, and machines and renewable energy systems that are related and the utility systems. So I think the, the groundswell idea is definitely, definitely a good one. We'll try to do that. Let's communicate on that as well, how if you guys want to be involved, how we can do that and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Unless somebody quickly has another question, I'm just going to say thank you. There's a, I mean, it's, yeah, I was really glad to hear that we had a presentation from you. So thanks for whoever got that set up. I think that was IO. Yeah, thank you. And the best best way to continue the follow up, so we should communicate through the forum. Yeah, if you want to talk to us as a group, yeah, through the forum. Mm hmm. Um, Excellent. And if you if you find some places on our wiki where you think there's an we should be uh, linking to your stuff or or whatever, 
just um, make it account or, or let one of us know. The, yeah. The wiki is still very, um, very loosely organized. So we certainly need to add some links to, to our friends out there, groups like yours and what you're doing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Are you the lead organizer and kind of lead instigator? Or? Well, we don't, we don't you have that because, like I was saying, we don't even know who we are yet. At the moment, we're just people with um, with similar ideas and priorities. Yeah, um, yeah. but on the on the wiki, I'm certainly one of the people who can make sure that things get done. And um, yeah. And start. yeah, yeah, excellent. And definitely, I mean, let's talk about how we can start building in all this other functionality for the calculations and all that so we have a full and robust open source tool chain in my view it's just a matter of time before that happens because i mean no way is proprietary software going to be able to compete with something that improves over time i mean yeah. i just think but it's definitely have, have a look on the forum there is um if you don't find it let me know but somebody did start a thread uh on quantity surveying um so the the current options and what's happening there is, is uh discussed in that thread on on what on quantity on surveying so bills of quantity and and the okay. whole field yeah. yeah yeah that's great um yeah so thanks very much i'm not <laughs> somebody's Thank making you. fun of me in the chat thank you rafael <laughs> uh, yeah. as far as i could see from the from the forum the osr in general we don't have any um important agenda points so unless anybody thinks we need to talk about something while we're live here now then um, we might be finished for today, this morning, tonight, whatever time it is around you. Does anybody have anything that we need to sort out right now? I don't think yep. so. If everybody turns on their microphone, we can say uh, good night and goodbye. And thank you to okay. Martin. <laughs> we'll yeah, see. Yeah. yeah. So thanks a lot thank for, you very for much. being here today. Thank you, Martin. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Let's collaborate. Let's make it happen. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.